A year into the COVID pandemic, Asian Americans come to grips with a surge of racist slurs and violent attacks. From racist taunts, rants to physical assault, thousands of cases have been reported in recent months. No wonder U.S. President Joe Biden signed a memorandum to tackle anti-Asian hate and violence. Celebrities and activists are now on board using their fame to stop the hate and to call for racial justice. What's behind the rising tide of anti-Asian violence and how can the U.S. ensure the safety and the rights of Asian American community? Let's loop in our panelists. Joining us in New York, Anthony Chen, former J.P. Morgan Chase Chief Economist in Los Angeles, William Lee, Chief Economist from Milken Institute in Beijing, Tang Jimeng, Professor from the Center for American Studies with Beijing Foreign Studies University. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. What is going on with the hate crimes? Why there is such a sharp rise of them? For example, Mr. Chen, in Los Angeles, the increase is more than 110 percent 2020 compared to 2019. What happened? We've gotten a lot of uh, publicity that the uh, virus uh, started in, in China and somehow uh, that message is going in the wrong direction and somehow it's being connected to Asian Americans as a proud Chinese American. Uh, it saddens me to hear this, but whereas I live here in New York City, the news is is suggesting that hate crimes against uh, Asian Americans is up uh, over 800 percent. And the thing to keep in mind, it's not just Chinese Americans. Uh, the hate crime is against basically all Asian Americans because they're all uh, considered by the people committing these hate crimes as all coming from China, which is extremely sad. Uh, Mr. Lee. What about in your part of the world, uh, uh, near Maryland, Virginia, Washington, D.C.? There's a very large uh, Asian community here, Vietnamese, uh, uh, South Asian, um, as well as uh, quite a number of uh, Han Chinese who are come here to work at NIH and, and a lot of the professional organizations. Uh, the, the reported crimes are less here because uh, the newspapers seem to pick up less of that news. But I know that there are many more incidents now than there were before. But I should say that uh, you know crimes of this sort uh, against minorities is very typical of a response when a country is under some kind of duress, some kind of fear, and whether it was the 9/11 uh, and and the, the the backlash against the Middle Eastern people, or or uh, during World War II the backlash against the Japanese Americans, this kind of um, uh, extreme desire to find blame and to assign blame is something that is very characteristic of a country that is uh, in a crisis. And, and, and we see this not only in the United States, but we also see yeah. it in Europe as well. What the law enforcement agencies uh, are doing, how are they tracking, recording, and also helping at this point? Much at all? Mr. Chen, your knowledge. My impression is that not all the crimes are reported, and therefore, if they're not reported, it's very difficult uh, for the uh, law enforcement to actually do something about it. And it sort of reminds me of something that Albert Einstein once said. It's, uh, it's not so much the evil in the world that's taking place. The real evil is, is, what, is what occurs when people see evil and they just look on and they don't report it. And I think that's the situation with uh, the hate crimes. We need to report it uh, so that it can be tabulated and law enforcement actually can take action. But I think that one of the things that really distresses me quite a bit is that there are seven states in the United States that don't even have a hate crime law. So in those states, uh, when these things happen, they don't even have uh, a, a way of uh, categorizing these things because they don't have hate laws uh, on the books. So I, I think we have to raise awareness. I think the fact that the president of the United States signed an executive order uh, in his first uh, two weeks in his administration against Asian Americans is a step in the right direction. So my hope and expectation is that as we move forward, uh, that these things uh, uh, will in fact be addressed. But I think uh, Bill is uh, spot on in saying that uh, these things occur uh, when a country is under duress. I think he's he's 100 percent correct. I, I'm afraid I'm a less optimistic than Anthony about the uh, ability of law enforcement to contain some of this violence. Uh, we've now gone through a huge uh, political turmoil in this country 
uh, and there's a large movement to, to fund the police, to reduce the uh, funding for law enforcement agencies. And, and I find that difficult to understand in this kind of environment where we now have to rely more than ever on law enforcement. And instead, we see there are prosecutors in Los Angeles who refuse to enforce laws. Uh, we, 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 we see the, 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 the police handicapped uh, by, by a fear of being accused of being uh, racially profiling. So I think one of the things that we as Asians have to face up to is that we have to rely on ourselves more uh, and we need to, to somehow uh, make it aware that uh, the defunding of the law enforcement agencies is causing us, the victims, more harm than good. Professor Tong, we, over the past few months, have been hearing about Chinese-American communities inside the United States in order to avoid being attacked, have to form their community alliance, that they have this app among themselves. So once one family is under attack, the others are taking up the things that they can and try to come over and help. But how much hope shall we pin upon that kind of community help? After all, we do need law enforcement. I agree with my fellow two panelists. I think that uh, right now, the uh, circumstances can be very dire in terms of uh, this very crisis under which Asian Americans are suffering uh, this very lack of protection from the law enforcement. And so I agree with uh, both of them that uh, uh, Asian Americans need to rely on themselves more to fend off the attack, to fend off the hate crime that is now prevailing in communities uh, around the country. But then um, self-reliance uh, is just one way out. Uh, institutionalized to sort of the, uh, hate crime or discrimination must be dealt with institutionally. And so in this sense, I would strongly recommend, I would strongly actually argue for, again, I mean, um, this institutional protection, uh, the reliance on the law enforcement, yeah. and that needs uh, the country, the government, uh, the government's systematic effort. Uh, I'm glad that the President Biden mm. signed directives, actually, uh, in uh, actually providing more uh, protections and uh, see to contain this crime, and especially uh, the crime originated from this very um, sort of a scapegoating. I think scape scapegoating in the U.S. Uh, is particularly uh, kind of a disastrous, especially under in in, in the current situation. Uh, a country in, uh, caught up in this very crisis. Uh, Mr. Lee, earlier you talked about you are less optimistic than your colleague, uh, Mr. Chen. Uh, but uh, are you seeing that the law enforcement's willingness to implement, uh, for example, the executive order and the uh, basic uh, uh, responsibility to protect uh, everyone, including Asian Americans? Yeah, there's been a, a huge shift in the way prosecutors view their job. The classic example is what's happened in Los Angeles, uh, where the uh, district attorney uh, is refusing to prosecute uh, criminals uh, because they feel that many of the criminals themselves have been victimized by society. And in order to right that wrong, they feel that we should not cause that victimization to occur twice, even though they committed a crime. Mm -hmm. um, many of the prosecutions uh, are, are not being uh, uh, pursued. And I think that's a, a travesty. And, and, and as much as I, I would love to agree with Professor Song about, about the need for institutions to enforce the law, uh, these institutions uh, are selectively choosing not to enforce the laws that are on the books. Uh, and putting more laws on the books is not going to help matters. And, and, and when the police themselves are asked mm -hmm. to do something, when we reduce the funding for the police departments around the country, then we are left even more naked to the aggression of, uh, of crazy people. How strong, Mr. Chen, is this issue uh, should be of concern, the so-called selective racial equity? In other words, uh, you know, at one time, uh, paying more attention to uh, the protection and the the civil rights of one ethnic group uh, while well, at the same time ignoring, not necessarily on purpose, but might be the result, uh, the others. Uh, we have seen, you know, African-Americans' uh, rights have been more uh, being mentioned in the media, 
uh, certainly much more paid attention by the law enforcement. But now we see as such a huge problem with the protection of Asian Americans in the U.S. society. What do you make of that? Racism uh, should have no color. That is, everyone should be protected against racism, whether it's yeah. African Americans, whether it's Asian Americans, yes. uh, whether it's Greek Americans, all Americans should be protected against uh, racism. Of course, that's an ideal uh, situation. And if you defund the police, that's going to be a little bit more challenging. Although bills suggest that uh, correctly that uh, you have some prosecutors around the country choosing not to enforce uh, the laws as rigorously as they should, that does not mean that that's going to continue indefinitely. I grew up in the inner cities, and some of the people that I grew up with still tell me that in the inner cities, uh, poor uh, public housing projects where I grew up, uh, there are a lot of people there that are suffering from this, uh, uh, this situation that is going mm -hmm. on. So my hope and expectation is that several years from now, as many of these uh, individuals realize that they're suffering, uh, that we will see the pendulum move in the other direction and, and we will once again start to protect everybody uh, against these, uh, these crimes. Uh, when you see stories of a 91-year-old mm. Asian American being thrown to the ground and being hit from behind, that to me is not even a hate crime, that's murder or attempted murder at the very least. That has to be enforced yeah. uh, against Asian Americans, against African Americans, against Hispanic Americans, against anybody, because they're human beings and human beings need to be protected. Uh, Mr. Tong, there has been a, a lot of talk uh, uh, in the media now about the protection of Asian Americans. And uh, there seems to be uh, increasing awareness, but, uh, what do you think is the fundamental issue here? Earlier, two gentlemen touched on you know, the role of the leadership. The former president of the United States uh, wrongly repeated suggesting that the virus is related to one uh, geographical location, China, uh, even though the WHO uh, research had been demonstrating that it is coming from the animal world to the human world. So now, Despite all of this, corrections by scientists, by the media, by experts, there are people just going to take advantage of this all the time. So, Professor Tong, uh, have we seen that before? What does it take to change? These old habits die hard. I mean, um, some people just cannot change their mind mm. because of ignorance. I mean, ignorance is the major roadblock to understanding and to achieve a fair and also just understanding of the issue prevailing now around the world. And so I think um, in, a, in addition to the role played by the leaders and by the government, by authorities at various levels, teachers, educators, uh, law enforcement officers and lawyers and bankers, I mean, all people need to be involved. I think that right now it's high time we have a massive campaign uh, around the world, in particular countries, mm -hmm. in the U.S. and in China, perhaps, that we actually need to launch a campaign uh, to to educate. I mean, to highlight, to to enlighten people, and so that we can cleanse all these sundry imperfections of our societies. The United States actually used to be a beacon light for yeah. people. I mean, uh, people around the world. But now, I think, during this very time of crisis, we need to sit down. And we need to sit down with educators and educators sit down with students in the classroom environment, in the community environment, hold more town hall meetings and try to actually identify these issues. Because hate crimes, hate crime is not just a crime. Mm. It's also a psychological sort of, uh, in, it produces psychological impact. I think that right now the people of color mm. in the U.S. are traumatized. This very trauma can have a long-lasting impact on their psyche because trauma actually destroys the very meaning, the yeah. very fabric of meaning of culture and value. And in fact, it will eventually, in a sense, destroy the attachment, the emotional attachment, uh, uh, the, the emotional attachment of people to that very community that they love, the country they love, and also the race of which they okay. feel very proud of. But this is not just the uh over the past four years, this has been a deep-rooted problem of racial equity in the U.S. And Asian Americans are not just being attacked now, but 
Also, during other times, it's just that the media spotlight is not down there yet at that time. So, Mr. Li, uh, would you expect fundamental change? Uh, would you expect uh, uh, real uh, constructive uh, solutions or only one-time thing? Human nature is very difficult to change, and it really has to change on an individual level and on a family level. You have to be taught uh, what proper behavior is in public. And I think one of the things that uh, we should look at for policy is that the fastest way to alleviate the violence against Asians is to alleviate the source of distress in society, which is the lockdown economic hardship that's been imposed by the, the measures, the health mm. the policy measures to counteract the virus. And, and I think we've gotten a lot of attention about right. Asians because Asians have historically been a silent minority. We, we have been able to, to be able to become successful in American society because we have been able to achieve uh, individually and we've been able to, to do so in, in a very quiet fashion. Uh, now that the, the violence has turned against us because of a prehistoric way of uh, naming diseases, I mean, after all, diseases were named for Spanish flu, Ebola, uh, Lyme disease. They were geographically based naming conventions that are very hard to, to, to change in, in the popular nomenclature. And, and, and unfortunately, that naming nomenclature has now assigned Asians as a source of distress. So, so to alleviate the violence against Asians quickly, uh, rather than finding some way to change mm -hmm. human nature, which I don't believe can happen by legislation or by, by fiat, uh, we need to alleviate the distress, which is get the vaccines out, get people vi uh, vaccinated, open up the economy and let people work again. When people yeah. are working and able to earn income and conduct their lives, they're not gonna go after uh, uh, Asians uh, uh, in, in, a vi in the kind of violent fashion that they have now because of that, of that, of that dismay that the Asians caused them economic distress. Uh, incorrectly, but nevertheless, that 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 association is there. So, so to me, the fastest alleviation for uh, Asian violence is to get the economy working again. Um, my last question. You know, recently there are a lot of things going on inside the United States. Also, for example, the girl reading the poem at the inauguration ceremony that the media uh, blasted in a way, and and also recently Billy Holiday's movie. Uh, about her insisting on singing Strange Fruit, which of course is uh, a song describing the racial problem in the United States. Uh, at her time, it was extremely difficult. We see a lot of cultural products coming out about a uh, African Americans fighting against racial discrimination in the U.S. Uh, how much can we expect that the same attention spotlight will also focus on Asian Americans. By the way, all Americans should be protected and all uh, actually in other parts of the world should be protected. But uh, Professor Tong, you are as a cultural expert. How do you see that? I applaud the young lady who actually cited her own poem on that very day of uh, Mr. Biden's inauguration. I actually was so very much moved and touched by her courage and also her bravery in addressing the issue and in issuing such a call to put an end to the very polite uh, that African Americans are suffering or racial or minorities were suffering right now uh, in yeah. the United States, especially during the four years of Trump administration. I myself actually cited lots of these um, historical texts, uh, including musical text and also filmic text. If you look at look back at my um, bookshelf you see bob dylan bob dylan used to be a major uh subject matter i taught in my class and who was also known for a major voice against racial discrimination in the 1960s uh, -huh. uh his several songs are often cited as an example like haiti carol blowing the wind all these great songs uh are actually being taught here in china and i'm sure in classroom in the united states to address these issues. And so once again, I believe artists should be standing up. Artists like the young lady should stand up against yeah. this very violence, this very violation, so that the nation may be hitting the call. I mean, to end this particular duress and also stress. And so okay. once again, I think um, back in Asian Chinese tradition, scholars are often uh, held up okay. as the philosopher or the scholar king leading the nation out of trouble, out of crisis. Now I would rely 
And I'm hoping that the artists again, like the, like what the artists have done in the 60s, like Bob Dylan had done, like the Beatles, and like uh, Bill, uh, John Baez, I mean, stand up against these violations, stand up against these crimes, and raise the awareness of the very destructive impact of those crimes. There are a lot of reminiscences, certainly your answer, Mr. Tang, if I could point out that. Um, Mr. Lee, I also would like to address that question to you. Um, we've seen quite a number of popular productions about uh, Asian Americans, about the Asians as well. For example, the rich Asians or something like that, that have been very popular. Um, even though we've seen back in the 1980s and 90s, there were things like Joy Luck Club uh, and other things that's trying to uh, try to create much more uh, of a bridge understanding the Asian culture or the Asian American culture. What have changed and uh, how, how do you think that atmosphere is going to cultivate the understanding of uh, Asia, of Asian Americans, and of, of their cultures. The first wave of artists that you just mentioned did a lot to bring awareness of what Asian life is like in the United States. But unfortunately, it's a very stylized picture of overachievers and super rich people. What we need is a, uh, a Chinese or Asian American Spike Lee, uh, someone yep. who would produce a, a, a film of the way Auntie and I grew up. I grew up in Chinatown in New York City, uh, mm. and, and I grew up among gangs. I grew up among uh, uh, people who were going to be destined to go to jail at the minute they graduate high school. Um, and, and, and at the same time, uh, this, the people around them were also overachievers who went and got Nobel Prizes. So, so that dichotomy of life within the Chinatowns of the United States, uh, films can be made to bring out that we Asian Americans are human. Uh, we have all sorts of different people, good and bad, and overachievers and underachievers. And I think to widen the perspective for Americans, uh, non-Asian Americans, about who Asian Americans are is, is needed. And, and um, filmmakers like Spike Lee did that tremendously for the Black people. And, and I think we need mm -hmm. similar artists here uh, as well for, for Asians. With that note, I would like to thank the three of you for a very resourceful conversation. Um, Anthony Chen. William Lee and Tung Ji Meng. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. The world is changing fast, taking all our lives with it. But we can change it too by seeking answers to problems through discussions and debates. On World Insight, I ask direct questions to real people in the know, seek genuine answers, but respect diverse perspectives. Our live global debates tackle the most critical issues head on. World Insight with Tian Wei. Go beyond the headlines. Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Way down with deadly pandemic and tense geopolitics, the world has become more divided than ever. And the boundaries on how far jokes can go for laughs has been pushed from sharp wit to outright offensive. Joe Wang, a well-known Asian-American stand-up comedian, has been an active voice for Asians against the systemic racism in the U.S. He has slammed the white supremacists and initiated a petition to include the Asian-American story in the U.S. textbooks. He was also invited to the White House Correspondent Dinner, where he roasted then-Vice President, now President Joe Biden. What's the punchline in reflection? in a year marred by both COVID and discrimination against Asians. Can he, Joe Wong, win over a tough crowd or will his campaign fall flat? I visited him and our conversation starts with some of the latest development. Joe, I, I noticed that from last year I talked to you, I think it was in the spring, oh, yeah, 2020. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you were mm -hmm. not laughing and joking as often as you did before anymore. You are really serious. I know you're a serious guy to begin with, uh, uh, yeah. but, but, but you decorated well before. <laughs> yeah. And now I, I think- I hide it well. I hide yeah. it really well. But now I think there are so many things that you have to digest, both as one with conscience, an individual with conscience, and also an individual who is having people laugh as your best ultimate goal. Um, I think you are quieter 
than before, if I noticed the right. Oh, thank you. I guess I just found my conscience in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my biggest gain. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> One year is already enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, doing all these uh, craziness, it makes everyone think, you know. Um, uh, one thing I've been thinking is uh, how come one phrase from the President of the United States could cause so much harm to the Asian American community in America. Um, Did you figure out the answer? I think the answer is uh, as long as uh, countries don't respect each other, there will be racism in America. And racism in America is not a domestic issue. Uh, like as long as people uh, like Trump are calling another country shadow countries. You know, once you have this kind of uh, uh, public discourse, there's got to be discrimination, you know. Um, so I think words from the leader of a country matters a lot. And also, uh, this kind of discrimination is the legacy of uh, hundreds of years of uh, com colonialism. I remember when I was doing comedy in Boston, there was a comedian. Uh, he's Indian American, but he talks about colonialism. Mm -hmm. At the time, I was like, why are you talking about this? This is such a, an a old... Deep, also a deep topic, a right? A deep topic, but also it was so, so many years ago. Who cares about it anymore? But, uh, but then later on, I realized that uh, a lot of these racism is actually uh, handed down from colonialism. You know, colonialism basically you conquer another country uh, with hard know, power. Yeah, with hard power, but then uh, you do treat people in other countries as, as if they're inferior. You know, they, they, then that kind of mindset is still there. So um, as long as people, countries don't treat each other on an equal footing. It's hard for people within the country to be, you know, treated equally. Anything have changed? You know, you were talking about racism, mm -hmm. but you talk about it in a way in such a daily life at that time. Yeah. At that time, now in re reflection, it's so quiet and peaceful, isn't oh, it? Oh yeah, yeah. Those yeah, during Obama years, people probably didn't feel that way. But after Trump took office, you just you look back and say, like, "Wow, those were such." in the nicer times, you know. But then, of course, there, there were things we can improve even upon those times, you know. Uh, especially for Asian Americans, they still don't have a good represent representation in, in American politics and entertainment. I did a show f for a fundraiser back in January 2020, almost a year ago. After the show, I remember this white lady came up to me and said, oh, thank you for the comedy routine, I didn't know there was an exclusion act. It was, it was such an important thing in Asian American history, but a lot of people just don't even know it. So I think it's, it is important for comedians to incorporate certain you know, history or, or their own culture, infuse it into their comedy. Sounds like there are a lot of issues that have not resolved along the way, mm -hmm. and they piled up one after another, and there is where we are. Yes, yes. Trump might be the one straw that broke the camel's back, you know, uh, because without you know, years or even centuries of accumulation of this racism, uh, one phrase from him wouldn't cause so much harm. Uh, but then, you know, you look back, you just realize that, uh, you know, in schools, corporations, uh, even entertainment places, uh, racism toward Asian Americans is very well re uh, received, you know, very well accepted. People just think, oh, that's the way it is. Um, they didn't even realize. This. Exactly. I, I even have... I even have Asian Americans who grew up in America saying to me, hey, you're lucky you grew up in China. I said, why? He just he said, because just even since school, there's just so much racism toward Asians that are, that are tolerated. Um, there's, there's so many examples. Um, there, there's a Vietnamese kid who's, who failed math, and he's asking his teacher if the math teacher can help him out. The math teacher said, oh, two men of you are successful. 
you have to take one for the team. <laughs> so that's, oh man, there are so, yeah, there are so many of these stories, just heartbreaking. But all these were shoved under the rug. And once, uh, once people feel, oh, it's okay to be racist and yeah. open again, all this stuff just came up. You know, for comedians, yeah. one of the tricks that you have is to make stereotypes yeah, yeah. and break the stereotypes, yeah, right? Yeah. But uh, here is the seriousness and also sensitivity of racism. Mm -hmm. How are you going to articulate that in your creation of jokes? It's, it's trial and error. You just have to always try these jokes and see uh, what people can take. But of course, you can't always just uh, tell jokes that people feel comfortable with. Then you're not telling the truth. Right. So it's always a balance thing. But will you allow other comedians to test that with you? For example, as yeah. an Asian American? I wish there were more comedians who would test that with me. But most, in most cases, uh, comedians from other ethnic backgrounds, they would just say certain things without even asking the Asian people how they would feel. And that's, that's been the problem for years. Um, I've witnessed a situation where oh, something happened. You know, all these uh, white and black comedians are thinking, oh, will this be offensive to Asian people? And there's one Asian guy sitting right there. Nobody's asking him. <laughs> <laughs> He's right there. Just uh, ask uh, him. Yeah, I know. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> so that, yeah. Transparent that, guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the same thing with their television shows. They will have an Asian character, but in the whole writing room, there's no Asian writers. So nobody knows what the Asian sensitivity is. And they just make things up as long as people are laughing, it's fine. So over the years, it just, they reinforced a lot of Asian stereotypes. Yeah. How, did you, how did you do that? I think this is not my standard, yeah. but then another comedian said this. I think it makes a lot of sense. Tell me more. When you write a joke, uh, you just picture, if you write a joke about Asian people, for example, you just picture there's an Asian person right there. Can you say this to his face? If he can say this to his face and he's okay with it, then it's probably an okay joke. But otherwise, don't just try to think that, oh, I just hope there's no Asian in the, uh, in the audience tonight. Uh, that's why if a new comedian tells an offensive joke, I always give this person more uh, benefit of the doubt. Because mm -hmm. you know, he's new, he's testing things out. But if this person, who's done this like for years and he's still doing this uh, racist material, then, you know, he's just a racist. Will things change much, you think? <sighs> I hope so. But On the surface I, or real, in real essence? You know what? Um, I'm just hoping we can at least change on the surface. I've, I've been telling people, you know, hypocrisy is the best we can hope for. <laughs> because <laughs> at least... That's in, a nice line, by yeah, the way. Yeah, at least in hypocrisy, people are pretending to be something, they at least acknowledge something is nice, and we pretend to be that. You're watching World Inside, coming up in the program.